Welcome to another episode of Give It A Nudge. Today we have Sophie Hood from Soul Tonic. This is gonna be an exciting episode. We don't do a lot of consumer ones on Give It A Nudge, but today we are talking about not just a consumer product, but something that is going to be preventative and helpful in your health. So welcome to the show, Sophie. Thanks so much for having me, Steve. First time we've met, I was like that. We don't get a lot of that. A lot of the guests we have come on, I've met at an event or met somewhere. So it's exciting to have someone new. I know, it feels like you can kind of throw me into the deep end. With well, no ramifications right. because we don't have that personal relationship. <laughs> this is true. Yeah, I can upset you and it won't matter. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Actually, I reckon a lot of the best episodes we've done are people that I've never met because well, because it's a journey of discovery as opposed to mm. me kind of just sort of recounting it for people on the show. But mm, that's, that's a fair point. So let's give you the opportunity to introduce yourself in mm -hmm. terms of your business. Give us your sort of quick 10 second, 30 second, one minute pitch on, on the business and then we'll sort of get back into you and how you ended up getting into it. Okay, great. I'm Sophie Hood. I founded Soul Tonic, which is um, a tonic using Korean pear and Hervenia dulces, which are East Asian native ingredients that have been scientifically proven for many, many years to help alcohol metabolism, mm -hmm. general well-being and liver detoxification. These ingredients are also used for a range of other um, health benefits and have been used for a very, very long time in Asia, but particularly South Korea. Yep. Uh, I became obsessed with South Korea and I noticed this, <laughs> well, to be fine, I was obsessed with the fashion and the skincare first, but I was obsessed with what else they were doing. So I kind of wanted to be more like them and discovered this industry, which is very, very cemented in South Korea, but not as much in the Western world. No. And I couldn't find a brand that I aligned to in Australia. So I decided to fly to Korea and create my own. And cool. that is Soltonic. So how long did you spend in Korea? I've been there multiple times now, yep. but the trip where it all really, really happened was a couple of weeks, but I was meeting my manufacturer over Zoom because this was COVID yeah. time for, you know, months before and sampling kind of through DHL and yeah. post. <laughs> so where did the initial obsession with Korea out of all the Asian countries come from? Why, why Korea? Have you ever tried Korean skincare? I can't say I have. If you have, you would know where the obsession really? comes from. Yeah, 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 it's all around glass skin. Like every it, every second place in Korea is either plastic surgery or it's some kind of K beauty shop. And I just became obsessed with the ingredients that were in these, you know, beauty potions. And then that kind of translated to just Korean people in general. And they were so trendy and cool, and they had fashion that was just really well made. And look, I came from a finance job. So yep. for me, this was my outlet, like yep. my creative outlet, <laughs> you know? So I just became obsessed with the culture. Okay, interesting. So, all right, let's go back into your history. Let's find out where you came from. So mm -hmm. you grew up in Sydney, right? Sydney, born and bred, yep. yes. And then you, your first job um, was in finance, as you said, or was it consulting? Consulting, yeah. but within performance improvement advisory in the finance sector. So it actually started with one of those rotational graduate programs. Yep. Very young. I was 20 years old. I was young for my year, so I finished my degree quite early at Sydney Uni, went straight in and, yeah, went through this kind of rotational program and ended up in this finance team within the advisory um, sector yep. in within financial services. So I was there for three years. Yeah. Um, hated it. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> I mean, that's about as sort of standard sort of career path yeah. as you can get, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. Exactly. Was it, a big, it was a big four consulting? Yeah, right? big, yeah, yeah, big four consulting. The benefit is that you're meeting a lot of other people. Yes. And those people um, have now amazing jobs, right? And I've still, the relationships that I've formed are still probably, got. you know, second to none, right? That's probably why you go in there, yeah. really. Um, and leveraging off, you know, partners and that kind of thing. Um, but the work... Oh gosh, the work was horrible. It was so, so bad. You know, I kind of got catfished a bit because if they didn't have the right job project to put you on, they would put you on some kind of like random risk advisory job and yeah, ship okay. you out to some unknown location that, you know, it wasn't my CBD kind of suits dream. Right? No. <laughs> um, so yeah, did that. And then I managed to get a job at Moet Hennessy, so yes. LVMH. I saw that. That's a huge leap, right? Yes. <laughs> from, from like... Isn't it? Was it Deloitte or was it... Uh, EY. EY, right. So from Sorry. EY to Motions, I mean, that's just massive. It's so crazy because LVMH has obviously got every luxury brand. Every brand. Ev like ever, you know. And if they haven't got it now, they had it and they sold it. Exactly. <laughs> they don't have it because they don't want it. Yeah. So... Um, so different. And it was within... An, it was a commercial analyst role, which was... and the. Job, the job description was so far from what I 
had been doing an EY. But I just did one of those things where you recreate your resume to suit the job that you're going yeah, yeah. for and then just hope for the best and wing it. I know that when I get in front of someone, I can get the job. That's just my bread yep. and butter. Interviewing is my thing, but it was the on paper kind of um, resume that was the issue. Did you seek that brand out or was it just an opportunist you saw an ad or how did it come about? So I've been obsessed with brands. I like going to say champagne. I thought you were going to say well, champagne. Well, okay, well, <laughs> that's next. I am obsessed with, sorry, my obsession with champagne was to my demise because that actually happened during my time at Moat Hennessy yeah. and it made me a complete champagne snob and that's now ruined me for life. <laughs> it's re a real issue. It's costing me a fortune. Um, no, I, I was obsessed with the kinds of brands that were under the umbrella. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't, I didn't have to be at LVMH, but right. I wanted to be at a brand you where I could see a product and it would make sense to me, especially if I was still going to be in finance. Um, so saw the job uh, application and just luckily the hiring manager had come from Deloitte. Yeah. And so he kind of understood that you can. You see a lot of that. You can yep. go into yeah, yeah. Um, kind of consumer-based brand. So did that and that was amazing. Um, that taught me so much. And that, How long were you there? You were there a little bit? Only there for 18 months okay. because then I actually got poached to go to saw Red that. Bull. The coolest brand. Were they up at the um, the... the the round buildings at the Greens back then? Yes, they were. We used to recruit for them back then. I yes. recruited a few roles. I'm the, trying to the remember. Silos, yeah, 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 the, the silos. Yeah, the grounds of Alexandria. I, remember, yeah. I went in those silos. They're cool. Yeah, yeah. My dad, you know, in a weird turn of events, his um, company, property development company at the time, had actually helped build them. They're super cool. Yeah. So, I mean, that's... They're not like, there anymore. They, they they were there, though. Are they gone? Yeah, they moved. They moved around the corner, still in Alexandria. I didn't on, know that. On uh, Duty Street. I mean, that's just the most epic brand ever, Red Bull. Red Bull is something else. It's not, you're not, yeah, you're not working for a product, right? You're working no. for a brand. You're yeah, working yeah. for a potential experience. Yeah. And that potential experience and learning about that and how to harness that has taught me more than I could ever imagine about running my own product-based business. Do you think that kind of environment was conducive in you being quite willing to take a risk and start your own business. 100%. Because you're not, you don't get that kind of environment in Y. In Y does not teach you how to be an entrepreneur. No, no, no. Red Bull, you've got, they, they do help harness mini entrepreneurs because they have these wider projects where even though I was in the commercial finance team, I'd be working on these culture or music projects yeah. and helping execute them with the marketing team and the media house because they just want everyone to be able to have a different experience within. Yeah. So, and Red Bull gives you wings, right? They even have something called Wings Leave, which will they? give you um, paid leave to go and pursue your passion project. I did not know that. So I would go to Korea, I went to Korea both years under using Wings Leave. Wow. And so that is, this is when you became obsessed with Korean yes, skincare. Yes, it, it was my time at Red Bull. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I've never, I did not know this about Korean skincare. I find Korea a fascinating place. It's a, it's a very, it's its own culture. Have you Asia. been? I have not been, no, but I've. It, it's like the trendier, cooler, younger sister of Tokyo that's way more chilled and is not as nearly as manic. But it's still out there. Yeah, but they're just, they're just trendy. Like they're just cool operators. Yeah, interesting. And so. You decided to start your own business? Yes, I did. So tell me about how that decision was made. Yeah, so um, at this point I'd spent quite a few years working in beverage brands, global beverage brands, yep. all of which had amazing stories. Two of the, two of the best beverage brands in the world. You yeah. casually throw it in there, but, I mean, they really are. <laughs> no, 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 it's completely fair. Yeah. And um, what I learnt was I wasn't just in finance roles. I was really, I was really bought into the, the story behind it and every my onboarding for both roles was less around you know what the role description would be or anything to do with your day-to-day -day job and it was all around um buying you into a piece of this like kind of culture that they've created yeah and that culture is what I decided whilst I was there that I wanted to create of my own but using something that I was really passionate about which was South Korea yeah so I knew that I could launch a beverage because I had been in beverage. You'd seen it. But unfortunately, what I didn't know is that working in big companies can never, ever, ever, ever prepare you <laughs> for working in a startup. Like no. no matter, in no realm can it properly prepare you. No, it can, there's no, there's it can give you some confidence to think that you can do it because you've worked for a beverage brand, but it is just not even on the same playing field. But what Red Bull did give me was it gave me the confidence and it gave me some 
connections and it gave me some really good mentors that I could leverage to really um, to really launch into the Australian market. Yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet. And so well, it gave you wings, right? Mm, exactly. Um, and so how did this drink come about? Because it's, it's unique to you, right? Yes. This, this recipe. Yes. Creating a recipe for a drink is not a simple thing. Like creating... Yeah. Um, skincare or creating toothpaste yes. or anything that requires multiple ingredients that are not basic cooking, right? Which is not flavorsome. Yeah. How did you how did you come across this this recipe? How did you create it? How did you I just want to know because I'm fascinated. Your drinks are well explain to me before you tell me how you created it in in a little bit more detail what your drink does and, and how how it works. Okay, so my drink uses two ingredients that have been scientifically proven that when consumed prior to alcohol will reduce your hangover symptoms the next day. And the way that they do that is by reducing they have an enzyme in both of the ingredients we use that yep. reduce down this toxin called acetaldehyde. Right. And acetaldehyde is the toxin you build up when you drink alcohol. Mm -hmm. So when you drink it's not that you're dehydrated that's not, that's kind of a myth that can that help right? you. Being dehydrated gives you a headache just generally. Like if you're out in the sun all day yep. and you don't drink water, you're going to get a headache. It's 100%. not from the alcohol. The alcohol is this toxin. And everyone's liver has a different ability to pre, like re, um, process, process this toxin. But what this these ingredients do is these ingredients help support processing the toxin. Right. So it's setting you up for the best chance to feel less shit the next day, but then in <laughs> There's another a quote. way, yeah. There's a quote. I love that. Yeah. We, should, we, should, we, we will cut that quote that yeah. out yeah. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but what it's also doing is, it's it's like when you're you're feeling like you're sick, so you start taking some vitamin C. Mm -hmm. You don't even know exactly what it's doing. I don't you think, think it does anything. That, you don't think that it's, it helps you, but everyone has their own little things. In yeah. Korea, it has been ingrained in them that two thirds of the population will drink something before they drink two alcohol. Two thirds. Yeah, two-thirds and of the South Korean population. It's like brushing your teeth for them. You go out, you drink something first, then you drink alcohol. Is that, wow, two-thirds. And do they need to be together or is, that, is it just they superpower? Like if you drink one, will that help? And if you drink another one, will that help? But together they're superpowered or do they so need to be together to work? There are different ingredients that have these properties. Yep. The beauty of Soul Tonic is that I tap into a patented uh, extraction technique where all the nutrients are kind of in the skin of these ingredients right. and so I boil them and then extract them and create as much possible of the nutrients as I can in an easily digestible right. pouch that still tastes good. So you're kind of balancing efficiency and taste yeah. as well. So and are they like a root or are they like, what, what are they? So one is a plant, so one's a Korean pear which is a Korean pear so yep. they can be up to the size of 500 grams, they're different to a normal pear. Jesus. Um, yeah, they're they're much larger than yeah, a normal much pair, much larger, <laughs> and they're really really good for rehydration as well because right. they've got a really really high level of potassium, so mm -hmm. obviously electrolytes. Yep. Um, so we have you know people over there would drink them drink cream pear juice just for rehydration as yep. a natural kind of Gatorade, as well. And then the other um, ingredient, Hervenia dulcis, is a plant and it's used a lot in medicine. So okay. It's quite medicinal. Yeah. Um, and that's because it's extremely anti-inflammatory, antiviral, and it. Um, contains this enzyme that helps detoxify alcohol. And so did you stumble across this because you're obsessed with skincare and then you're obsessed with the entire culture? Yeah. Did so you get into K-pop, by the way? I'm not fully... K-pop's a, K a bit too, like, poppy for me. I like the, the like, cooler side of Korea. Okay, Less, just wondered. Yeah. <laughs> I'm more into, like, the Koreans with, like, the fine line tattoos and, like, they look... Yeah, yeah. You know, know. I've seen that. You know, that vibe. Okay. So, anyway, back to the story. Yes. Did you... How, you're obsessed with the culture. Yes. You obviously find out that two thirds of the population are doing this. I'm yes. assuming by going. Yeah. And you go, why are you drinking that? Yeah. And out? you're seeing in every Seven Eleven that there's like fourteen different right. products. So you're like, what the hell is this? Yes, correct. And so then you go, you know what? I'm going to make that because we don't have that in Australia. And I've just worked for two. You know, I've worked for Champagne, and now I've worked for Energy Drink. I'm actually going to do something that's going to be really good for you, as yeah. opposed to just fun, which is what those two really are. Exactly, and intersect kind of between wellness and play, and that's yeah. kind of who I am. Like, I can definitely have a few drinks, but I have experimented with every health trend, fad, whatever yep. under the sun. Wow! Like, I, I'm happy to lean both ways, you okay. know. And I really love this idea of prevention, and I feel like prevention is is something that we it's a feel good thing. It's a, it's a moment that you can do something for yourself, but you can also share it with friends and kind of every good story starts first with the salt tonic, which I love as well. But then we have a lot of people who don't drink alcohol at all and drink salt tonics as yep. a 
afternoon, pick me up, you know, instead of a coffee, they'll have it after the gym, they'll have it as a smoothie base, whatever. Okay. And so how do you, how long does it take you to create, how many flavors you've got by the way? So, well, the, the flavor is the ingredients, right? Because right? it's the natural flavors from the right. ingredients. I have my hero product, which is the Korean pear tonic, the pre-drinking, mm -hmm. and then I've got a new product coming as well, which is um, for drink after drinking. Right. But I can't talk oh, so too you much got, about you got that. your pre and your after. Yes. Okay, cool. Interesting. We'll have to get you back on when you release that. Yes. But So how long did it take you to get the, the recipe right? Probably took uh, almost a year of sampling. So, and that was going to say, how did you do that? Was it just you sampling? Was that literally or, or you in a group of friends or whatever so it was? So I, I enlisted some friends yeah. as well. Um, what the problem was, it was, the, it was being an Australian girl through COVID, not speaking Korean. a <laughs> single word of Korean. And Korean, um, South Korea was quite locked up during yeah. COVID. Like you actually couldn't yeah, it was enter, massively the, locked up. Enter, the, enter there at all. Um, the issue was finding the right manufacturer to fulfill my dream and to help create a formula that would make sense. And that process was probably the harder bit rather than creating it. Because once I got the right manufacturer and I could tap into this uh, extraction technique, it was, a, it was a lot easier to you yeah. know, get to the outcome. And how did you do that? Like, I mean, like you said, you don't speak Korean, you're not there. Mm. I know you've got contacts in the drink world, but how do you find a manufacturer in Korea during COVID to manufacture your drink? How did you do that? Yeah, so I eventually, <laughs> after I kind of got scammed once. Everyone gets scammed. Everyone, you have to get scammed you do. to then not get scammed, you know, to have your wits about you. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so I actually went through the official government trade organisation. Like so an Austrade kind of it's thing. It's an Austrade, but it's called... Yeah. Um, Kitra, like Korean International yep. Trade Association, and I had my business plan, I wrote my whole thing, and I submitted it to them, and they gave me a translator, and they actually started arranging meetings with right, the right manufacturers that could be of support. Yeah. And so then I just started doing meetings with the translator. So this is a lot of work, right, to do mm. this. Like, you needed some serious persistence to do this. Yeah, you could have easily just gone, you know what, I can't. I'm just going to go back to Red Bull. What What do you think it is? Well, so at this time I'm still working full time. Yeah, I imagine yeah. you would be, yeah. So what made you keep going? What made you not go, this is too hard? Or what, I'm going to go and try and find a manufacturer in another country where they speak English. What do you think that was? I think it's, it's a quote that I always come back to, which is, um, you know, if it, if it was easy, everyone would do it. And that's an easy thing to say. And a lot of people say that. But what do you think it was that made you actually do it? Like, because... Everyone knows it was easy, everyone to do it. I know, we all know, but, but that, I, that doesn't mean people don't just give up. And no, I, particularly that's true. during COVID, which it would have made it all the harder, right? Because you couldn't go there. I think so I was I'm just impressed. So I want to know why. Now. Yeah, no, I know. I think there's something, obviously, there's something in me, right? I'm quite a uh, persistent, competitive human. So <laughs> when I say that I'm going to do something, I typically do it. Right. Because I feel like I'm going to let myself down. Okay. So I try to challenge myself in ways to further me, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I put a lot of pressure on myself, which can be my downfall as well. You put mm -hmm. so much pressure on yourself and you end up just really, really stressed. But on the converse, when you put enough pressure on yourself, you get things done and you follow through with things. Absolutely. Look, you answered the question in the fact that you told yourself you were gonna do it, right? Mm -hmm. You're one of those people. There's a there's a book called The Gap and the Gain, which mm -hmm. is a really interesting book, you should read it. It's mm -hmm. um, It talks about how when people are in the gap, they're trying to fill the gap with what they're trying to do, but not enough of them ever look at the gain, i.e. they don't look back on what they've achieved. Mm. And like you said, sometimes that desire to push can be a downfall. And that's mm. the moment where you need to kind of go a little look back and go, actually, I have achieved this, and it kind of spurs you to keep going again. Mm. So it's a really interesting book. You should read it. Mm. Um, the Gap and the Game. Fascinating. Gap the Game. Okay. Um, yeah, nice. Yeah, I, think I think it would suit your personality to, to read that one. Okay. Um, okay, so cool. you've got your, I mean, we're not, this is not, a done deal, right? You finally got your recipe. Well, distribution, that's not a simple thing. I know no. you've got some experience, but it's not, you can't just ring everyone up and go, hey, let's let's get into it. How did that, how did that work for you? No, it was quite tricky. So I had to invest in the first 50,000 units. That was a minimum yep. order quantity. Um, so Which is a lot. Which is a lot. <laughs> did it come to your house? It came to a <laughs> random warehouse in Western Sydney. Okay. And that was because my forwarder basically said, hey, I've got some warehousing facility. Perfect. Like, do you want to put it in there? And I said, absolutely. Like, I don't know where else to put <laughs> it's it. fit in the garage. And then I would just do trips from my rental apartment in Bondi to this warehouse and take as many boxes I physically could and then store them in my garage in right. Bondi and then uh, in the morning and at night I would go around to like my favorite um, grocery shops and liquor stores 
and I would basically just give them product and say, hey, can you just put this on your counter and yeah, yeah. see this is what this is the concept, see if it sells. And what ended up happening was they would call me the next like few days and they would say, hey, people are just buying it because they're just intrigued. Like, yeah, yeah. They, they think it looks cool was the words. It just looks great. Um, and the branding's been a huge um, part of the business and the way that it looks and how interesting and disruptive it looks has really, I guess, encouraged people to purchase it without actually understanding the science or the methodology. So there's, yeah, there was two parts. There's the education side, but then there's the, also just the intrigue. Yep. So I started cementing distribution like that, but that's obviously quite slow and then obviously online as well. So you were doing B2C, you were doing direct-to-customer through a Shopify store or whatever yes. as well. Yep. So you're doing both. Yes, and I was just invoicing them through Shopify. Yep. Um, and then I won my first multi-grocery deal, as in multi, it was a chain called QE Food Stores um, in February. Where are they? I've not heard of them. They're all through They're all through Metro Sydney. Um, okay. So they're on like in Paddington on Oxford Street, in Newtown on King Street, in Milsons Point, St. Okay. Leonard's, um, Bronte, Waverley. Yeah, I can't um, believe I haven't seen them anyway. Darlinghurst. So they're, they're kind of a premium grocery store on every main uh, strip, like every hot strip. I live in Tamarama, so you'd zone. think I would have come across them. Yeah, in, in, Bronte, Waverley. Yeah. you would, no, Randwick. I'm not, I'm, yeah. Anyway, I'm going to look for them now. <laughs> yeah, you will, like Oxford Street even. Like. Yeah. Um, so, and I won that and that was great. And that, that was through that giving away free almost. Well, that was because that was I kind of harassed the head buyer okay. through LinkedIn and just going to her house and dropping off product. Yeah. And... Then eventually she, we formed a relationship and we have an amazing relationship today. And anyway, that having them as the 13 premium grocery stores yep. where I was starting to go into their warehouses instead of having to do kind of direct store, that kind of propelled me to be able to expand my distribution a yep. bit further. Um, and then I streamlined everything and then went into Dan Murphy's in a few months later and, and Amazon a few months after and that. And how'd you get into Dan Murphy's? Because that is not, everyone wants to be in Dan Murphy's. That is a massive distribution network. Is that, how did you do that? Same way, just hassling people, hanging outside people's houses? Yeah, similar way. <laughs> um, my old commercial director from Moat Hennessy, he yep. actually saw what I was doing and he has come on in a capacity to help support the business awesome. as well. So he doesn't work for them anymore and he, we kind of leverage some of his networks. So this um, is where the, the, kind of, the past comes in to help. Well, exactly. This is why yeah. you should never, ever leave a company on bad terms. No. Because you never, ever know when they're going to come and work for you. So, um, yeah, he's come on board kind of in a kind of a part-time uh, capacity and he had some connections at Dan Murphy's. And then when I got in front of them and told them the story, then it was a lot easier to sell through. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me, what's been the hardest thing and what's been the easiest thing from when you set out because it's often quite not what you think it's not so one of the hardest things so i actually went on a national tv show as well which one um it's gordon ramsay and janine ellis's latest show oh, called yes. food stars i haven't seen it but i have heard of it yeah so i won that show and so janine, how good janine ellis is my mentor so i meet up with her monthly That's and gordon ramsay and i have a direct line of contact um, is he Australia based now or is he UK no, based? No, he's in the UK. Yeah, yes, I thought. Yeah, he's all over the place. This was his first Australian TV show ever. So he was just here for a month. Um, so the hardest part was actually uh, a lot of things that came off the back of that. So obviously public exposure, and which is good, but then also bad. So you get exposed to things and people and whatever. That, bad people too. That, yes, exactly. And mm. so what I didn't anticipate about running a business is the people management and they're awful. dealing with difficult people that might not even be inside of your business but adjacent mm. has been the hardest part. So, you know, I've had to involve lawyers in things. I've had to involve – there's been some really tricky and difficult conversations and things that I've had to manage. Baptism of fire. So unforeseen. Yeah, it will so nasty place. things that have come from good, essentially. Yes. Like you've won this competition. It's like yeah. amazing. Oh, my gosh, this is the beginning of everything. It's exactly. going to be great. And then all this nastiness has yeah. come out of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, not surprising, unfortunately, but interesting. Yeah, but it's something you obviously would never think of when you no, start you a wouldn't. business. You not just do not think. And it's the people side that has been the hardest. And I'm a people person. So for me to say that, I can't even imagine someone who doesn't like dealing with people, what they would do. It would be so difficult. Yeah, well, look at most of the tech founders out there. Well, exactly. It must, they, they must be traumatised every think, day. Seriously. Well, a lot of so them come hard. on the show. I it's think a so lot of them are traumatised after the show more than they are maybe. Mm. But look, I think, yeah, you have to obviously, if you can, hide how people do. People are the most, having run numerous recruitment companies, right, I'm very aware of people. Yeah. They are the most difficult 
thing in the world. I mean, from a recruitment perspective, they're like, you've got the most unreliable product in the world. Mm. But in any capacity where you're dealing with people, it's the variance is just massive. And, mm. and you don't know who's actually genuine and who's not and all those kinds of things. And, and there's unfortunately way too many non-genuine people out there. And it's hard to tell at the beginning off the Particularly back Particularly when you've got a profile. That's when you get even more non-genuine people. Well, that's the thing. And then things that have come off the back in terms of media attention, blah, blah, yep. blah. That's been the side that I didn't prepare for. And what I didn't realise when I started this business was that I would have to be the face of the brand. I didn't realise I would have to show up and my face would be on all the newspaper articles. I'd have to be on all the social media. That just didn't occur to me. But now I'm realising that to get the cut through, yeah. you have to. Someone so, has to. and it, Exactly. It really does need to be the first. Well, look, first, congratulations on winning the show. How thank amazing. Yeah, thank was that you. the easiest thing you've done so far? Um, <laughs> no, that wasn't easy. That was traumatic, I would say. Um, once you're in the show environment, it's kind of like apprentice style, as in they eliminate you out and Gordon Ramsay and Janine are you know, banging their heads saying, we don't know who should get eliminated, you tell us. So it then turns into a bit of survivor type Oh, mentality. which channel was it? Uh, channel 9. Because it was quite recently, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Channel 9, it aired in April of yep. this year called Gordon Ramsay's Food Stars where they're trying to find Australia's most innovative new food or beverage entrepreneur. I remember seeing the shorts, but we were launching a new business, so I wasn't watching any television at so all fair. during that time. But, um, yeah, I, I remember seeing it all. So, and was it, were you on site or did you go and come back? Or? No, I was, I was in Melbourne for the four and a half weeks, okay. staying in service departments yeah. and filming. So you know, it was fully immersive. Oh, yeah. It was like filming MasterChef for, for entrepreneurs and shorter. I might have to watch that. Yeah. You, I'll tell you the specific episodes to watch. Well, now I know who wins. It's not going to be as exciting. Yeah, but. there's another winner. There's two winners. <laughs> Okay. And so what's been the easiest thing? What's been the easiest thing? The easiest thing is probably, and this is something that I didn't think would be easy, is to just um, the ability for me to learn areas of the business that I didn't, I would think that I'd be quite resistant to. So some, a fear of mine going in would be that I would have to be upskilling in, you know, supply chains and ops and marketing yep. and doing everything right. And I was really fearful of how that would go and how that would make me feel. But the easiest thing has been, just how is how I've been able to adapt to learning things that are completely out of my skill set because of the gratification that I yeah. guess I, I'm getting from it. And I think the, your desire to succeed is obviously there, right? We spoke about that earlier. So I think your willingness to be open-minded and learn things. And the reality is most things are common sense. And most things are learnable. Most I things think. are learnable. The reason people struggle to learn things is because they're resistant to learning, mm. not because they're difficult to learn. And I think, I think that you've proven that already. Well, that's good. Um, I'm, I'm also impressed that you were so honest about what was really hard. That's, that, you know, a lot of people will come on and say that. That's, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> am, am I going to regret that? Well, we can the always, hater, edit, we can always are, edit it out. The haters are going to hear this. <laughs> oh, they hear everything. And so, okay, so where to now? Where to now? Okay, so I'm continuing to cement the product in Australia. That's yep. obviously a focus market given I am Australian. Yep. And, you know, it is an Australian brand essentially. Yep. It's got all the Korean history and roots and a big part of the brand is my Korean manufacturer, Mr. Park. We bring him into a lot of the branding and everything shot in Korea, but it's this kind of Australian Korea relationship Can that you buy people it in are buying into. Well, we actually just launched back into Seoul. Yeah. So through the coolest um, brewery in the my favourite uh, suburb of Seoul, Seongsu, uh, it's called Seoul Brewery, very trendy. They obviously know, have, have had access to these products for a long time, yeah. but not in the way that Soltonic looks. And not with that name. Like exactly. everyone, everyone should understand that Soltonic is spelt like soul as in yes. the, not as in S O U L, but soul it's S E S E O U L. -U -L yeah. yeah. Um, so that was just last week. I launched yeah. back into Seoul. How yeah. cool is that? Pretty cool. I mean, it should sell really well. I mean, you've named it after the city. So I know, I know. <laughs> just on that alone, you'd think so, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. hundred percent. So now that's really exciting. And that's not actually a market that I thought that I would be going after just because they have such so a many. saturated yeah. category. But really they're educated on the category. So it's actually a lot of it. It's yeah. sometimes kind of easier as well, especially because nothing looks, the packaging in Seoul, uh, the packaging in South Korea of these products are quite medicinal and old school looking because they've been And you've gone funky, right? Yeah. And trendy, as you really like that word. Yeah. yeah. Trendy, <laughs> it's, um, it speaks to probably a younger consumer who are already consuming these products but maybe don't feel comfortable bringing it to their friend's house because they don't think it looks good. Well, look, I think... The branding, think about, I mean, you've been in the energy drink business, right? Mm. So if you think about Red Bull was there, right, winning it and killing it, and yep. then Monster came along. And how was Monster ever going to take? Well, they just went out for the grungy 
crowd, whereas Red Bull was clean and sort of, you know, sporty. They went after the grungy motocross kind, of, and that worked really well for them. Yeah. It's a similar thing for you, right? You've got this old style product that's out there in Korea, and you're coming in with a new young one. It's, exactly. It's, it's going to work, right? It's exactly that's, right. Yeah. And I guess I just didn't think that it would work in Korea. And I just didn't think that that would be my target consumer. But, you know, the business evolves and adapts and... I'm kind of going where the business is taking me. That's the way to go. Yeah, so, and I'm jumping on every opportunity that comes, no matter where it is in the world. Yeah. And things are coming from all parts of the world at the moment. So, um, you just, never know. You might end up massive in Finland for all you know. Well, exactly. You could do. Yeah, the Nordics could be huge. You could be. Exactly. Be They're quite clean. Cool if they were. They yeah, I clean. know. <laughs> I feel like they'd like it. Very minimalist I feel design. Like I've seen the design. I think it would go well. Yeah, in the, you so you need I. to get over there. Yeah, no, no. I, I actually do have a bit of a lead over in the Nordics. So I've been working on something there, actually. <laughs> there you go, you see? Yeah, exactly. Um, so basically it's international expansion and... Um, it's international expansion, go. seeding it internationally. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I bootstrapped the whole thing. So it's... That it's was my next question. Quite difficult. So um, you've not taken on in any investment? No. That's awesome. It's been really difficult. Yeah, I would be. Yeah. So that's why I stayed at my full-time job for so long because yeah. I was just funding the business. And so when you were doing that, we'll touch on that now just briefly. When you were doing your full-time job and doing this, what, what sort of hours were you pulling? Because there's a whole thing about, you know, the hustle culture and working. It's not healthy and we should sleep and we shouldn't. And I agree to that to a point, but I also know there are periods in a business where you have to work horrible hours and get little sleep to actually just get there, right? There, and that, get off the ground, people have yeah. to understand that that is required to a degree. It's not forever, but it is required. Yeah, yeah. No, and that's a really good point because had I not worked the crazy hours that I did in the beginning, the business just wouldn't have had any distribution points. It would have had no momentum and it wouldn't have been able to form a, into a fully fledged business. Yeah. It actually just wouldn't have. Yeah. And sometimes time is of the essence. And it's some, and I had fifty thousand units, right? And that's yes, a, they have a, a lot. I was like, I need to get rid of them. Yeah. Like, what am I going to do? I need to sell these things, like now. So, I was working crazy hours. I was, you know, even I would, you know, my lunch break at work at Red Bull, I'd be just sitting out around the corner, just doing pumping out emails, pumping out yeah. leads. Then um, I was doing deliveries early morning and at night as well, and then weekends. What's the shelf life like on it? Two hours. Uh, just two hours. Walking. Two hours. Can wow. <laughs> so perishable. Um, two years. Two years. And that's because it's all natural, I'm assuming. All natural. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Two years. That's a long... Well, that... I mean, that's good when you have 50,000 of them sitting in a warehouse and you're not sure how you're going to sell them. But exactly. that's also extraordinarily long. Actually, What's, uh, what would a normal drink be? Probably eight to ten months, I would have thought. Depends what it is. Yeah. That's an Red Bull's about a time. year, I believe. Yeah. A okay. year to 18 months. Interesting. Well, I mean, congratulations. What, a, what an awesome story i love the fact that you bootstrapped it i really do with there's not enough people doing that it's really tricky and i have investors reach out to me quite a lot the benefits down the track are massive though. well that's the thing right i'm trying to retain as much equity as possible and also the valuation it, it, what is the valuation you know i've got all of these leads in all of these different places and how do you value it on it's just impossible valuations are <clears throat> I mean, they're a fantasy anyway, right? They're based That's off of I fundraising mean. and, and the valuation goes up, down, depending on what the market is. Mm. Unless you're selling the business, it doesn't matter mm. what the valuation is or raising money. That's the only two times it Well, that's matters. what I mean. So yeah. say I was raising money, it's this valuation that it would be quite difficult for me to do So is right it profitable now? now? It is profitable, but everything's being reinvested. Yeah. But that's, you know, that in itself is... So uh, I'm not taking anything from it. No, but that's great that you're uh, profitable. I mean, that's, you know, something that everyone aims for these days and mm. not a lot of people seem to be able to achieve. Mm. I'm very impressed. Um, so for anyone who wants to try it, who was watching, where's, where's the easiest place to buy it? If you haven't got it in your local store, obviously you can get it at Dan Murphy's. Yeah, if it's not your local store, probably Amazon for next day delivery. Yeah, They're yeah. fantastic because you can buy both a single unit and also a 12-pack. Okay, cool. So, okay. and Amazon's fantastic. They're so fast. Yeah, They're they faster are. than my online store. Like, yes, you, you still have your own online store as yeah, well? Yeah, so yep. you still have e-com. And look, look, people still order online. And especially those who are buying, you know, a, the 40-pack for an event or yep. they're buying a lot for their wedding. We have a lot of you know, oh, weddings yeah, and events and big corporate events and, you know, launches of things. Do you have a repeating kind of um, order that you can put in? I a subscription-based yeah, model, yeah. I need to put that in. I you need yet. to put that in. I, I have that for my coffee and I love it because I just don't have to think about it. It's so smart. I know. I've been thinking about subscription for it's a time. while. It's it time. Is, it is time. If there's anyone out there that can help, reach out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. Please. <laughs> well, look, thank you so much for coming. I'm, I'm super, super impressed. It is amazing to have someone that has just bootstrapped something 
I just, I love those. They come on the show. Um, and it's going so well. I can't wait to see where you go next with it. And I'm looking forward to seeing the post product when that comes out. Yes. So, so how long are we talking? Where are we now? We're in July. What are we thinking? Uh, for summer. Okay. All right. So, yeah. This, will be, this episode will come out before then. So this is like a tantalizing teaser for yes, everyone. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I love a little teaser. It's so annoying for, <laughs> as a listener, though. Yeah, well, no, that'll be all right. But we'll put some links underneath so that people can access and, and buy it as well. Fantastic. Sophie, thank you so much for coming on. It's a pleasure to meet you. And uh, I look forward to seeing what happens in the next year. Yeah, thanks so much for having me.